In 1970, psychologist Walter Mischel performed the famous Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. Now the experiment went like this. A preschooler was brought into the room by a researcher and it was sit in, he or she was seated at a table with a tempting treat, usually a marshmallow, cookie, or pretzel. And then they were faced with a choice. They could either wait and receive double the reward, a second marshmallow, or they could eat it immediately. And even though they only waited about 15 minutes, several kids really struggled to refrain. Now this experiment tested their ability to delay gratification. And they, became, they came up with these diversions to pass the time, like talking to themselves, singing to themselves, inventing games with their hands and their feet, or even trying to fall asleep to pass the time. The researchers followed each child for more than 40 years. And the group that waited patiently for that second marshmallow, they generally did better in life. They had higher SAT scores, they had higher incomes, and they were less likely to be overweight. Now, um, ever since, this experiment has become one of the most famous studies in psychology and has been widely cited evidence for the importance of self-control and delaying your gratification, in turn, for contentment, long-term contentment. In today's fast-paced and hyper-connected world, we are very similar to those little preschoolers from the experiment. We are met with temptations that promise immediate gratification, but often come at the expense of our mental health and our emotional well-being. From social media notifications to online shopping deals, we are faced with choices that, that test our ability to delay gratification for long-term contentment. A striking example of immediate gratification that comes to many of us and that we can relate to is our own cell phone. We have the whole world at our fingertips, and sometimes we forget that, but think about it. If you want to reach a friend that lives across the universe, across the world, you can pick up your phone and you can send them an instant message at any given point in time. If you want social validation, you can post a picture and you can instantly receive likes from people you know, like your friends and your family, and people that you don't, that are complete strangers that you've never even met. If you want to be informed, on anything and everything. You can pick up your phone and you can look and see the latest on celebrities, on political issues, current events, the second that they become relevant. In a Netflix documentary titled The Social Dilemma, tech experts from Silicon Valley raise concerns about the detriment of social networking which big tech exploits to manipulate and influence its users. The documentary left me deeply unsettled in many areas. We as consumers are unwitting pawns manipulated by those behind our screen who profit from our attention and the behaviors that come from our attention. Companies such as Facebook, Google, Snapchat, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, they operate on a business model that thrives off of keeping their users continu continually engaged on their platforms. They're constantly asking the question, how much of your life can we get you to give to us? These companies are entirely aimed at changing the perceptions and behaviors of users that is a way that is financially beneficial to them. It's not merely about the data collected from our watched videos, search history, or time we spend on certain content, but it's about the utilization of that data. Now this information is employed to construct an increasingly accurate model that can predict our actions, our feelings, and what will keep us ultimately watching or scrolling. Now, I've learned the extent of technology's grip on my life on my time and attention, and it really scared me. Online connectivity, one of the major allures of social media, 
is inauthentic, built on manipulation and deceit. Jason Lanier, the author of 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, says that online connection has become our primary means of engagement with one another. And yet, any time two people interact, the only way that it's financed is through a sneaky third party who is paid to manipulate those two people. So, we've created an entire global generation of people who are raised within a context where the very meaning of communication, the very meaning of culture, is manipulation. We put deceit and sneakiness at the absolute center of everything we do. Immediate gratification comes at the expense of our self-worth, identity, and mental well-being. A former executive from Facebook says that we curate our lives around this perceived sense of perfection because we get rewarded in the short-term signals, the hearts, likes, thumbs up, and we conflate that with value, and we conflate that with truth. But instead, what it really is is fake, brittle popularity that's short-term and that leaves you even more, and admit it, empty and vacant than before. People's sense of truth and reality is at stake, and it has disastrous implications. The number of hospital, hospital admissions for self-harm in young girls has skyrocketed since 2011. It's up 62% for older teen girls, and 189% for younger girls. That's nearly triple. Not only is mental health at stake, but our own sense of objective truth is at stake as we are fed information tailored to our interests, opinions, and location. For example, if you Google climate change is, you're gonna see different autocompletes depending on what Google knows about you and where you live. So some will see climate change is a hoax, but others will see climate change is causing the destruction of nature. Now the autofill is not a product of what is, or what is true about climate change, but it is only a product of the data gathered by Google about your interests and your biases. Now you can see how that's dangerous. Tristan Harris, the co-founder of Center for Humane Technology, gives us the big idea. He says, we've moved away from having a tools-based be tools technology environment to an addiction and manipulation-based technology environment. That's what's changed. Social media isn't a tool that's just waiting to be used. It has its own goals and its own means of pursuing them by using your psychology against you. If we are not careful with the way that we engage with technology, we can be psychologically manipulated into giving up our time and our attention to things that aren't consistent with who we are, with what we love, with the things that make us us. We can settle for a form of connection that is rooted in manipulation and rooted in deceit. And we can be fed information tailored to our interests and our biases rather than objective truth. Dr. Anna Lemke explores the neurobiological underpinnings that contribute to addiction and instant gratification. In her book, Dopamine Nation, Dr. Anna Lemke explains how dopamine drives compulsive behavior. Now, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is associated with reward, pleasure, and motivation. The more it is released, the more that individual wants to seek out that euphoric feeling. These behaviors provide momentary pleasure, but often leave us feeling empty and disconnected in the long run. Now addiction has to do with the dysregulation of the brain's dopamine system. Engaging in activities that trigger dopamine release develops addictive behaviors. Some dopamine-rich activities include the following. I want you to pick one that resonates with you and keep it in mind. Shopping eating out, work, productivity, and exercise. Now to resist addictive behavior, Dr. Anna Lemke uses the acronym dopamine, which is fitting. So this consists of naming your drug of choice. What did you think about earlier? 
and calling out how often you're engaging in that activity. And then you have to confront the problems that arise from having that in your life. Is it compromising your relationships, your sleep, your mental well-being in general? And then what follows is a period of abstinence. That's when you take action. This, if there's a 40-day period, then your brain's reward pathway will reset. And so that's the ideal mark of, when, of how long to abstain completely. And what follows is insight and mindfulness about that drug of choice. And then once you've completed your abstinence, then you can look to the future, deciding your next steps and experimenting with what works and what doesn't of the reintegration of that drug of choice. If you chose social media, maybe it's not deleting it and never looking back. Maybe it's reinstalling and using in moderation. Now taking Dr. Lemke's method of regulation, I tried it for myself. I found myself in a constant tug of war with technology. Screens have become my default escape in a way to drown out the noise of my own thoughts. Whether it was to distract myself from stress or simply to pass the time, I often found myself reaching for my phone in life's quiet moments. Because Lent is roughly 40 days, I saw it as the perfect opportunity to reset that relationship. So I deleted all media, social and otherwise, deleted all games, and then I also turned my phone on grayscale, which is a filter that removes the positive reinforcement of color. And it lessens the visual appeal of my phone. So basically, I made my phone really boring. <laughs> I wouldn't look at it. Um, I also shut my computer in a box, and I locked it away to remove any possible immediate yield to temptation. I found, that, ooh, I found that when I forced myself to slow down and take away my methods of escape, it was both challenging and rewarding. When I was free from screens, I became a better version of myself, more relational, more rested, happier. My mom's birthday was coming up, and usually I'd end up ordering something very generic online. But when I forced myself to be present, I thought of something that would mean much more to her. So in the following days, I patiently embroidered a dish towel with a scene from a nostalgic children's book that I remember her reading to me many times when I was a little girl. It was in this project that I realized the importance to create over consume. I learned that there's value in investing time and effort into meaningful experiences that endure beyond instant gratification. Dr. Lemke describes today as the age of convenience, as it is marked by instant gratification and easily accessible rewards. This era is categorized by technological advancements and overall convenience. Now, the very essence of convenience, by the way, is to minimize the time and effort required to meet one's needs or wants. But the convenience that we embrace comes at a cost. It diminishes our ability to invest in things worth waiting for, and to cultivate relationships slowly and carefully. Galatians 6.9 speaks to this very idea. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Wendell Berry, an environmentalist poet, sheds light on the importance to choose to love what is beyond convenience and beyond instant gratification. The wisdom from his poem calls us to love what is genuine, enduring, and beyond the confines of societal norms. Here are some bits and pieces of Manifesto, the Mad Farmer's Liberation Front, that have been meaningful to me in the way that I think about what it means to live deeply. So here goes. Love the quick profit, the annual raise, vacation with pay. Want more of everything ready-made. Be afraid to know your neighbors and to die, and you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be a mystery anymore. Your mind will be shut away in a little box and shut away in a little drawer. I mean, um, when they want you to buy something, they'll call you. And when they want you to die for profit, they'll let you know. So, so friends, 
Every day, do something that won't compute. Hold on. Okay. Love so world. friends. Every Love day, do something that won't compute. Work for nothing. Love Take all world. that you have Love the and world. be poor. Work for nothing. Invest in Take the all that you have Plant and be poor. Plants. Say that your main invest crop is in the, the forest that you did not plant. plant. Sequoias. That you will not live. Say that your harvest. main crop is the forest that Call you that did not plant, it. and that you will not live returns. to harvest. Put your faith Call in the two profit. inches of humans that will build under returns. the trees every thousand years. Put your faith in the two inches of humans that will build under the trees every Fly thousand easy years. Rest Go your with head love in her lap. To the fields. Lie easy. Swear allegiance to what is nice. Rest your, your head in her lap. And as soon as the generals and the swear allegiance to what is nice. The motions of your mind. And as soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false more trail, tracks than the way that you didn't go. Some in the wrong direction. Be like the fox Practice who makes more tracks than necessary. Some in the wrong direction. Now I want to be the kind Practice of person who chooses to love things that don't compute. Now I want to be I want the kind of person the world who chooses to love things the that don't compute. Wants in my life. I want to confuse the world and shake this grit that technology wants in the millennium. Life. Who's willing to wait? I want to be the kind of person who invests in my in own millennium. life and who is willing to wait patiently for the seeds that I've sown. I want to selflessly in life, invest in things that are bigger that than I myself. I want to selflessly I want to invest in things that are bigger than myself. But and above all, I want to take in the present. I want to be the kind of person easy who looks shape. beyond the artificial, but and above beyond all, the fleeting. I want to be the kind of person who looks beyond the artificial and, worth and beyond for. the fleeting, and, I hope you do and too. on to Thank what is you. real and lasting and worth waiting for. And I hope you too. Ms. Snyder? Um, have you found something that you want to invest in, like something specific? Hmm. I think, like an image that came to my mind um, when I was thinking about like deciding a topic, this was really hard for me, but when I was thinking about just what I love, I was thinking about playing in the dirt, like being with the earth in a cool way that's kind of lost on us now. Um, when I think about my family, I want to raise my kids in a way that knows nature more than their screen, um, who can just live life and not be influenced by technology in a way that's unhealthy. So I think about my family. Morgan? Hmm, I think, I think so. It was a really cool, it was a cool time. Um, I also think it's really interesting that there's 40 days of abstinence that it takes to reset the rewards pathway in your brain, and there's roughly 40 days of Lent. Um, I, don't think that's a I don't think that's a coincidence. So I think it's very spiritual and it's very practical. Um, it's a cool, a cool way to turn you towards what really matters. It was, it was. I think it was kind of a relief in a lot of ways because I felt controlled um, by what I chose to do. So when I kind of removed any possible temptation, it was, it was really meaningful. Um, but also when I was stressed or when I wanted to distract myself from literally anything, I didn't know what to do. Or sometimes I would be too tired to like read a book or do something meaningful, so I'd just go to sleep. <laughs> like, I was like, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> Yeah, Jerry. Uh oh. Uh, what was the book that you uh, embroidered? The children's book. book that I, oh, it was okay. It's called The Kissing Hand. And what did it say? I'm trying to remember. Um, but it, it like had something to do with like me leaving and like it's gonna be okay. <laughs> like, I don't remember what it was, but it was relevant. It was cool. Yeah. Uh, if you were, so that with the social dilemma, I've seen that movie too. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you were queen for a day, how would oh. you fix it? Oh, my gosh. If I was queen for a day? Oh. 
Um, I think, well, okay, the documentary talks about how like there should be legislative change and like they should hold these companies accountable for what they're doing in a way that like isn't really happening. So I would get on that. Oh, mine's still on. I have another question when you're done. You're doing so good. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Is it on? No, it's not. Good. Okay. Um, can I? Woo! Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh, That's okay. They're just baby hairs. They don't mean anything to me. I know, but they're so painful. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Okay. Yay! Okay, what do I do? Uh, you Pull you these. Okay, got it. I'll just let you get to it. What? 